Morning, church. Good to see you this morning. It's good to be back. And um, it was an amazing time overseas. And um, I'll be sharing some of that as the week goes on. But thank you for praying. And um, thank you for worshipping while I was away. I heard that uh, yeah, you had some good services over here. Uh, thanks uh, to Tansom, uh, to Kobe, um, and to Rick, who's not here this morning, but for preaching while I was away. <clears throat> One of the things I discovered when I was overseas, as I looked around uh, in the business of the world, was that we are all made in the image of God. But with the observation being an image of God, um, I observed that some were happy and some were confused and some were sad and all kinds of people. And the thought went through my mind, I wonder what it takes or what is the common denominator to us all. And this phrase came to my mind, uh, living life on purpose. But before I get into this, I want us to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. If there is ever a purpose, it is to know why we are alive. Thank you. You told us the answer <clears throat> 2,000 years ago. And you've given us the answer right in front of us through your word. And I pray today, Lord, and in the Sundays to come, that as your word is preached, Father, awaken within us that the inner man, as Paul calls it, Lord, that we may discover the truth of why we are alive. Bless your word, Lord, and bless the hearts that are good soil this morning. Those of us who are here in church and those who are watching on Zoom, bless the good soil in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Living life on purpose. With the subtitle, do you know why you are breathing? Do you know why you are still alive today? <clears throat> Before um, Jeanette Stevens passed away, um, many of my visits, and not just Jeanette Stevens, but some of the, the older folk, of our church who have gone to be with the Lord. One of the questions they usually ask me is, why am I still here? They want to, to leave this earth and go to be with their heavenly father. But that was a common question. Now, Jeanette used to say that to me a lot. I don't know why am I still alive? What am I doing? So I used to encourage her and I said, I think one of the reasons why you're still around Jeanette is that you can, make, you can pray for people, pray for your family, pray for missionaries. There are many, many uh, people that need your prayers. They need your prayer support and declarations and so forth. So, for the next maybe five to ten weeks, I'm going to speak on this topic, on the purpose of life. <clears throat> I hope, um, I don't know if Lawrence and have given out a copy of this to each and every one of you. Please have a look. Under mission, mission means purpose, <clears throat> right? You will see that we have, in the front page, you have the, the vision of the church, but straight after the, the, the vision is the 
mission. This is why St. James exists. And in fact, this is why everybody is on earth. And I want to walk us through <clears throat> these five purposes for you and I to, to know why we're on earth, <clears throat> why we are still alive, living on purpose. When you walk through the, the front doors there, you will see on both sides of the wall there are two scriptures. And one of those scriptures is the one I've got up there. Matthew 22, 37 to 39, but I've just quoted you 38, is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul. As I observe <clears throat> in, um, in Denver, Colorado, where I was, and even traveling to Chicago before we came over here, I observed from airport to airport the busyness of life, and I just watched, I just watched everyone. And I thought, hmm, there are those that know what they are alive for, and then there are those that are just being busy, just basically just occupying space. <clears throat> they have got no idea why they are still breathing. And so I thought, hmm, the purposes of our church, the reason why St. James exists, <clears throat> why we have the two scriptures on the wall, is to remind us, you see, before you ask many other questions like how, what, when, the very first question you have to ask is why? The why is most, most important. <clears throat> why are you married? <clears throat> why do you have children? Why do you have grandchildren? Why are you working? Why do you go to church? Why do you give money to different people? The why is one of the most powerful questions you have to answer. Why do you wake up in the morning? And what are you going to do throughout the day? The plan for the whole day beginning to the end, it all comes from why. You have to know why. <clears throat> you can't go through the motion just from one morning to the next morning, one day to the next day, one month to the next month, one year. You can't do that. Because the Bible says... We are here for a reason. So I'm going to unpack <clears throat> these very five purposes to let you know why some people are happy and content with life and why others continue to chase their tails. They never know. They go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, because they don't know. They're not settled within. You see, peace comes from within. When you don't know your purpose, you don't know your peace, whatever the latest philosophy is, gadget, idea, opinion, you jump at it. You say, oh, this is the answer. No, it's not the answer. Who knows that the textbooks that we study at science back then has been long obsolete? And maybe something, some things that were, were quite trendy five years ago, they're obsolete. See, so you can't just try and keep up with the Joneses and see what is the latest fad because the Bible says everything on earth is temporary. Temporary. So unless you know what your purpose is, you will try to bring the temporaries into your life and they'll continue to disappoint you because they're temporary. Nothing sticks, nothing stands. 
It's only one person that the Bible says is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that's Jesus. So why have I got this scripture up here? <clears throat> this is Jesus' answer when he was asked, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? Well, back then it was the law. And this is Jesus' response. Matthew 22, <coughs> 37 to 39 he basically summed up Genesis all the way to Malachi. He put the whole lot together, bang. This was his answer. He said, uh, if you want to know the greatest commandment, if you want to follow the commandment, the commandment, this is it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And so from today on, I'm going to unpack what, what does he mean by that. What does he mean by love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength? What does it look like? Because when you know what it looks like to love God with all your mind, soul, mind, strength, and all of that, you will walk in peace. You will walk in joy. You will walk in fulfillment. You will wake up in the morning. You know why you're waking up in the morning because you'll be excited to wake up in the morning. You've got a purpose. You've got something to do. You've got a calling from God that you are fulfilling. You are living in the center of the will of God. And it's awesome. It's beautiful. It's marvelous when you walk according to what Jesus has given us. The very, very first purpose is to love God. <coughs> and if you have a look at the welcome pamphlet, you will see love God and I've got in bracket worship. 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 Some people worship their jobs. Some people worship their spouses. Some people worship their children. Some people worship their hobbies. Some people, they worship their looks, what they look, they look like in the mirror. Some people, they worship their food. You can tell whatever people worship when you listen to their conversations. And that's what I was doing when I was overseas. Jesus says, your mouth speaks what you're full of. It doesn't take long before what you're full of comes out. Whether you're on the plane, the airport, supermarket, whatever the person is full of is going to come out. And when it comes out, you know what they're worshipping. You know what they're spending their time, the bulk of their time, thinking about. So it's very important to know why God has placed you on this earth. Jesus says, if you want to know why you're on earth, you're on earth to worship God first and foremost. First and foremost. By that, what he meant is love God. Did you know that you always worship what you love? Think about it. You always worship what you love. Whatever you love, you worship. You idolize that. You think about it all the time. You might even study and spend money, go on courses. Because whatever you love, you worship. Worship means to kiss the bride. It's intimate. Whatever you love, you go after, you chase after. That's called worship. <coughs> With all your heart. Heart is your heart. It's your passion, soul and mind. Soul and mind, will and emotion. And strength is your body, what you use your body for. Your whole being. Jesus says to the question, 
Jesus, what is the greatest? If you were to lump together all the commandments of God, what is the greatest? Jesus says, worship. Worship the one who created you, who made you in his image. Because when you worship him, you will discover why you were born. You discover why the way you are. There are different skills, gifts, abilities, even a personality. You will discover from worshiping God why you are the way you are. Because only the author of the book can tell you what the book is about. The author of the word is God. And he will tell you why you were born, why you are the way you are. Worship God, he says. Worship God with everything. So let's go a little bit further. What does he mean by this? Well, the first thing you know is the Bible says that the one that you're supposed to worship does not have a body. God is spirit. And this is the most profound truth that even people in church have missed for many, many years. You see, you look in the mirror, you look at others, compare yourself to others because you're trying to worship God <coughs> and you're trying to improve yourself. But as far as the Bible is concerned, this God you're supposed to love is actually a spirit. Flesh and spirit however, cannot communicate. This is one of the truths that really set me free uh, a wee while ago when I realized that what's happening to my body and my flesh is not connecting with God because he's spirit. You can't see him. He doesn't have a body. And therefore, the only way that I can actually touch God, so to speak, or communicate with God is through my spirit. Which is why it is so, so important for us to be born again. Because unless you are born again and that spirit within you, the Bible uses the word dead a lot in the Bible, <coughs> saying that the spirit of a person who is not born again is dead, meaning is disconnected from God. The person who is not born again is disconnected. You can tell that person everything about God. They may agree with you, but that connection so that they, they know who God is, is not there. You must be born again in order to know who God is. God is spirit, and those who worship, worship him, must worship him in spirit and truth. Now the verse now explains to you, if you want to worship this God with all your heart, soul, strength, and all, you must be in spirit <coughs> and in truth. Spirit is spirit because God is spirit and truth. Praise the Lord for Jesus. When he prayed in John 17, he says, Father, sanctify them by your truth. And then he defined what the truth is. Your word is truth. Now you know why I am so passionate about the Bible. Why I keep saying to you, you must fall in love with the word. Because if you do not know the word, you can easily be misled by anybody and everyone. People can give you their opinions and so forth, but there's only one truth, one plumb line, one foundational truth that can never change. Sanctify them with your truth. Your word is truth. God is spirit. If you want to connect with him, worship him. How? Your spirit. Make sure you are born again. How do you know you're born again? Acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in everything you do. Everything at your work, in your marriage, bringing up children. Acknowledge him. 
He substituted you on the cross so that you may live life, life in all its fullness. Where do you get those instructions from? <coughs> right here. The Word of God. Get into the Word of God. What else do we know about worshiping God? Well, we know, as I just pointed out before, Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now can you see why you must be in the Spirit and don't use your head when you're trying to worship God? Because you will miss him every time. You have to connect with God spirit to spirit. Proverbs 20 verse 27 says, The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. Interesting verse. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. Lamp of the Lord. It's a lamp of the Lord because God cannot touch, speak to you through your five senses that we have now. He can't. He can only communicate with you spirit to spirit. So your spirit is the lamp of the Lord or is the light of the Lord or is the candle of the Lord. Do not marvel, I say to you, you must be born again. I don't know if my family overseas are watching but I had the privilege of introducing my niece's uh, husband to Jesus. Incredible man, very knowledgeable. We talked about many things and everything. He had many questions. But at the end of all that, I said, the best person to explain all of this is the Lord Jesus himself. And you have to be awakened from within out. Because revelations doesn't come from outside. Revelations come from inside out. It's called the aha moment. When you suddenly know something that you have no way of knowing before, all of a sudden you arrive at something and oh, I never thought of that before. Where did that come from? Spirit. Your spirit passes it through to your mind, and then you know it. But you don't know how it came. That's the Spirit of God speaking to you. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you have a flesh, because every human being must be born through a woman. Now that's the fleshly level. That's one level of existence. And then Jesus says, but there's another level of existence. Spirit. Do not marvel when I say to you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, the incredible thing about this conversation is Nicodemus is known as the teacher of teachers. He was a teacher of Israel. He was pretty high up. He was like one of the top scholars of the day. He knew everything about the law inside out. But he never, ever heard of this. See, he was limited by his five senses to what he knows. Jesus says, no, there, there is another existence, uh, Nicodemus. <coughs> In fact, this is what Jesus says three verses before. Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot, note, cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless a person is born again, he or she cannot understand God, know God, communicate with God. Cannot. It's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. Cannot see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So now you know, in order to worship God, you worship him through the Spirit, you get your instructions 
from the book of truth, from the truth. Because only the truth will set you free. One of the things was quite interesting. Um, so my niece's uh, husband was John. One of the things that was very interesting in my whole conversations, loved talking with him, was the fact that he believed that being a good person gives you a ticket to heaven. And that came up numerous times, you know, being a good person. Until I see it, uh, John, the Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, this is why it's good to know your word, so that you can actually share with people the hope the good news about Jesus Christ. And I said, that means that you and I are on the same page. If we were to turn up to heaven right now on our good works, knock on heaven's door and say, God, let me in. <coughs> and God says, on what basis? And you say, well, and then you start on your list. List all the good things. God would say, have you ever told a lie just once? And you stood there and you scratch your head, oh yeah, I think, I think I did. What do you call a person who lies? Well, what is it? Liar, right? Liar, okay. Have you ever look at the woman and desire her. So you scratch your head. Mm, I, I think somewhere when I was at school. Because God says, just once, just once. Something you just done once. And God will go through the whole, the whole list. James, in the book of James says, if you keep the whole law and you stumble on just one, you're gone cannot go into heaven. Just one. Just one. So now you're a liar. You are an adulterer. And so forth. God will go through this list. So I said, that's why the Bible says, for all have sinned. All of us. Billy Graham sinned, has sinned. Benny Hinn has sinned. Anybody, any living person, all of us sinned. There is absolutely no good works that you can bring before God. Do you know why the law was introduced? All those two knots, the Ten Commandments. It was introduced to expose our sins. God knew very well what, what, what he was doing. He chose his people. He said, here's the promised land, but I know very well what you're going to do when you leave Egypt. You're going to struggle to keep my commandments and obey me. So here is the law. And as far as the Bible is concerned, from my reading from the whole Old Testament to Jesus' time, not a single person, including the Pharisees and Sadducees, could keep the whole law. Nobody could. It's too, it's too high. I mean, Jesus says, if you are angry with your brother, you sinned. I mean, how many times have you been angry or you, you, you flew off the handle at somebody? Somebody at work, your children, grandchildren. Jesus says, even when it passes through your mind, you've sinned. Can you see how high the standards are? which is why we must be born again. There is no other way of connecting with God meaningfully to use our human experience and our standard of what we call good and perfect and amazing. There's no way we can get there. So at the end, praise the Lord, 
I was able to introduce my brother to Jesus. And that's one of the longings in my heart when we get further down to purpose number three. is for you and I to pray for chances like that to introduce people to Jesus. And whether you know how to do that, that will be a good thing for us to learn once we get to number three. It's one thing being born again yourself is something else to actually pass it on to others. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you want to know God, God is love, God is peace, and, and so forth. You have to know that he is spirit, and only through spirit to spirit, you will know him. First purpose of life is to love God, meaning to worship God, and that means to do life together with Jesus 24-7. In your marriage, the Bible gives you how to worship God in your marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. That will solve a lot of arguments. World War Threes and so forth. If we just follow the word, it tells you what it is. Husbands, love your Wives, wives, respect your husbands. <coughs> the Bible says, submit to your husbands and as unto the Lord. And did you know that submission is not coercion? It's not forced. Submission is a decision of the will. You have to decide to submit to something or to somebody. The husband can't say, submit to me because the Bible says so. No, that's wrong. That's not submission, that's coercion, that's forcing. And a wife cannot say, love me, because the Bible says you have to love me. That's also coercion. Love is also a decision of the will. A decision that's made because you have seen, Jesus says, your word is truth. You, you have seen within the truth how you're supposed to act as a husband, how you're supposed to act as a wife. Can you see how good the word is? It gives you specific instructions on how we ought to live our lives. <coughs> Raise up your children. Train up a child in a way, of, a way that he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. So it gives us how to raise children. Now, sure, nowadays, the children may grow up and go off and do their own thing. But if this scripture is true, it tells me somewhere within there is the word of God that you input into their lives when they were young, correct? And one of the prayers you can pray for your children when they go off the rails, as far as the scripture is concerned, there are several things that the scripture teaches us. Number one, pray the laborers into their paths. Jesus says, look out, the harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. Pray the laborers into their paths. Somebody, maybe somebody was praying for John, and I was the one that ended up leading him to Jesus, introducing him to Jesus. The other way of praying for your loved ones is Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. So you can pray, Father, draw so and so to you. And number three is what I've just mentioned. If there's any scripture within them that they learned when they were young, you pray, Father, illuminate the word. Bring it to their remembrance. Bring it to their remembrance and speak to them through your word. Whatever that scripture is. Those are most common three ways that I can see in the Bible to pray for those that seem like they have gone off the rails. 
we are talking about worshiping God and how you worship God through your marriage, worship God through your um, through raising your children, and so on. When you're on a holiday, when you're at work, I smiled this. Early hours this morning, when I was contemplating this sermon, I was going around my mind. I remember there was a guy in a bank <coughs> many, many, many years ago, and um, he was swearing like, "Gosh!" And then I discovered that he went to one of the most popular Pentecostal churches in Timaru, and I thought, "This man is a..." Like, you know, go together with the born again people, and and here he is in work. He's like a totally different person. You see, we're supposed to love God wherever we are. We shouldn't lower our standards just because the crowd around us try to dominate the atmosphere. Share what God has given you. When you love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and so forth, and you experience, this is through your spirit, and then you experience this, um, like God starts to reveal himself, right? The secret things, um, Deuteronomy 29, or Exodus 29, um, the secret things, belong to the Lord, but those things that are revealed are revealed to us and to our children. When you worship the Lord and you have this love relationship with God through your spirit, God starts to open up to you and he reveals things to you and through that revelation, you will discover why you were born. You will discover why you, you tick the way you tick. Because he has wired you in a particular way. <coughs> so if you want to discover this very, very first and foremost purpose of life, try loving God. I've given you some, some ways over there of, of how to love God. Look at this scripture. <coughs> Jesus' own words. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. We will come to him and make a home with him. If anyone loves me, there goes the worship part. Anyone loves me, he or she will keep my word. Will keep my word. How do you keep the word of God, go with what you already know. Do it. Do what the word of God says. I come to, to realize now that there are talkers of the word and doers of the word. And my word, there are so many talkers and very, very few doers become doers of the word. Doers of the word. So, loving God, worshiping God, doing life with God 24-7. Look at this scripture. Go to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. See, this is the essence of prayer. This is the essence of communicating to God on a daily basis. God says, if, if you want to know me, if you want to come closer, draw near to him, and he will draw near to you, James says. He says, call upon me, talk to me, and I will answer you. Not only answer you, I will actually show you mighty things that you have no ideas. Have you ever consulted God about your life? Have you ever asked him, Lord, why was I born? Am I doing what you want me to do? There are lots of people who are working in jobs that they don't like. Just a way of making money, bringing income. 
But see, there's a difference between working in jobs you don't like and actually working somewhere where God has wired you to work. There is a sense of fulfillment. You wake up in the morning excited because you know this is what I was cut out to do. Vast difference. Vast, vast difference. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus even says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Never anyone, uh, shall, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given me t- them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Do you know what I say? When you are in this love relationship with Jesus and you know who he is, you know why you were born, you know what, what you're supposed to do right now. When you're in this love relationship with Jesus, Jesus says no one can snatch you out of his hands. Protection, favor. No one. He says no one. You've been sent on purpose. You are fulfilling my purpose and I see to it that you will finish on purpose. You will finish on purpose. Live life with a purpose. Wake up with a purpose. Go to sleep with a purpose and wake up the next day getting excited. Thank you, Lord. I think one of the reasons, even though we all know that Thanksgiving is so powerful and we support and we're supposed to give thanks to the Lord every day. One of the reasons why people fail to give thanks is they don't know what to give thanks for. They don't, they don't know their purpose because they're meandering. And because they're meandering, they, they're not really sure whether they're actually doing the right thing or not. You see, worship is heart to a heart communication between lovers. That's what worship is. I pray that the Lord will um, reveal himself to you as you go after him. This This is one of the things that when people ask, um, how do I know God intimately? The answer to that is put him first. Whatever desires you have and hopes and dreams, put God first. How do you put God first? Talk to him. Say, God, I'm done with this life. I'm done with this flesh and all these desires. I'm done. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech thee, my brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, as your reasonable service. That's how. He says, make up your mind. You you, you are done. You're done with all these other things that are trying to to steal the the love of your heart. And your heart is going out so many different places. It has to come to a point where you made a decision, enough is enough. I'm going to find out what my Lord has placed me on earth. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, By the mercies of God. It has to be the mercies of God, my friends. Because mercy means that you are saved, protected from what you deserved. There are many, many times you should have had an accident. There are many, many times your business should have failed. There are many, many times that somebody should have tripped you up. Many times. That's what mercy is. The mercy of God is upon you. So Paul says, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beg you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Service means serve. So, to know God, you're not just passively, oh, well, God is going to show up one day. No, go after him. Pursue him. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. James says that. Draw near to him. Lord, I heard that the very, very first purpose why I was born is to worship you, is to know you intimately as my heavenly father, my creator. There is a reason why I think the way I think, feel the way I feel, contemplate the way I contemplate. There is a reason. And it has to be bigger than what I'm doing right now. It has to be. It must be bigger than what you have now. It has to be outside of what you have now. Because if you can do your visions and your dreams, God doesn't have to do a thing because you can do it all. But I believe when you worship God with all your heart and he reveals things, there are many, many things that he has put within us that he wants to fulfill, but they are not fulfilled yet. They are not fulfilled yet because we haven't died we haven't become living sacrifices. We are still doing our own thing. We're trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. Failed and failed and failed and failed. And the Holy Spirit is sitting within us and, and saying, when are you going to give up? And let me show you how, to, how it's done. Worship God with all your heart with all your soul and strength. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. Do you want to know a word from the Lord for you today? And that's it. He says, this is the very, very first right in the top of everything else you were born for this is it love God love God and that's why you will see in the front over here I just simply put love God and I put the word worship may you become a worshiper of God where you are sick and tired of being sick and tired where you made a choice I'm not going to live life the way I'm living now. It, it, it has to be a decision that comes from you. Where you can say, God, I was born for much, much bigger than this. I can sense within me there is a reason why I was born. And then go after it. Pursue God. Ask him, what do you want me, Lord, to do? And start to become a living sacrifice. It says to offer your bodies yeah bodies because you can't save God with with a spirit it's one qualification of being on earth you must have a body those who are on earth without bodies they're not called human beings they're called spirits or ghosts or whatever but if you have a body well there is a purpose there is a reason why you have a body why you are alive Paul says by the mercies of God, present. Ask God while I'm alive. I want to be healthy and so forth, but I want to serve you, God. What is it? What is it that you want me to do so that you are happy with me and I'm happy with you and I can die one day totally fulfilled? Totally fulfilled. One of the things I said to my brother before I prayed for him. And by the way, he's home now. Praise the Lord. Not bad going from ICU to go back home. He's got his walker exercising and so forth. But one of the things I said to him was, I said, if you want to live 10 more years, you can. It's your decision. 
But the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. You have to go with the word of God, fulfilling this purpose of why you are alive. <coughs> and that's why he's still alive today. There is a purpose for him to be alive. Do you know why you are alive? Do you know what are you doing? Is what God has called you to do? Well, I pray that this scripture from this day onwards, I don't know if I will elaborate on this next week, but may you, may you know the heart of the scripture of what Jesus, when he summed up everything you read in the Old Testament, he summed it up with this. The next part will be next week. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your soul, your mind, your strength. Your soul and your mind, by the way, is emotions. Make sure you use your emotions properly to the glory and to the honor of God. And next week, love your neighbor as yourself. But you must get this one first. You can't love people with your own love because you will run out. I know I have run out. Because we are humans. You can only be patient for so long and then somebody does something and then big X beside their name. We are humans. But if you have this, Love God first. There comes the fruit of the Spirit. It's called patience. You see, the fruit of the Spirit will start to kick in. When somebody makes a mistake, you are patient. The other fruit of the Spirit is kindness. It is goodness. And on and on. You see, the fruit of the Spirit will start to kick in. And you start to look at them and know them. And you say, well, Lord... Forgive them, they do not know what they do. And you start to pray for them instead of thinking of ways how to get even. You bless them. That's next week's introduction. But you must love God. You must know who he is. Worshipping, put some worship music on at home, in your car when you go to work. Feel yourself with who God is. Listen to the scriptures. Worship God. There are many different ways. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us today that we are alive to be worshippers of yours. Thank you, Father God. I think everyone over here is born again. That our spirit that had been awakened and are alive right now can communicate with you. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us with that tenacity to go after Jesus, even after today's service, Lord, to seek him out, to read the word, to meditate upon the word, to know what it is. Because Holy Spirit, I believe with all my heart, and I believe all of us here was born for a reason. One day we will leave this earth and we ask, Father, please help us to fulfill our missions, our purposes before we die. We don't want to leave this planet and miss out what we were placed here to do. We thank you for your word, Lord. May it grow deep roots within each and every soul, with every heart who is listening this morning. And that the fruit of loving you, of worshipping you, will be evident in our relationships with our spouses, with our children, people here in church, and wherever we go. May they manifest who you are through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.